Hi guys, so welcome to your class uh, of statistical physics and thermodynamics at UXZ. So let's start uh, our class today. This is our first class, so let me write it down for you. So this will be the full course that uh, we are going to look into detail. Uh, so the idea to basically to basically give you the glimpse of what basically called a stat Mac and uh, how it is connected with the thermodynamics, right? And the connection, especially to thermodynamics. Right, so we are not going to look into very detail of, uh, of the thermodynamical aspects uh, here, but the point is the to incorporate thermodynamics in such a fashion where you can understand the statistical mechanics so that's the very goal of the of the course and the course is basically designed for the student of grad grad level and post grad level that's the way we design this course so what you are going to be benefited when you are going to go through this course the all exams at grad and post grade grad level let's say jam let's say net let's say gate other various phd exams or post grad exams of india and abroad i mean all these exams will be covered in this course what we mean when we say we cover things we cover things in a two way that's a theory and first the course will be providing you the theoretical aspects of the of the of the problems and then followed by problems and solutions, right? So that's uh, the motto that we are looking into it and uh, all sort of questions which comes in this uh, category of exams, uh, uh, we are going to delve, delve into those sort of questions right now. So uh, before we, we start this, let me remind you who we are. So that's basically, you can go to this website, uxit.com and find the de detail about the batches that currently going on. At UXL, let me remind you, we come in various category, let's say school. So at the school currently, we are looking the J uh, exams and J classes are running. You can take a look at grad. Basically we, and at post-grad, we comes in just right now with physics. So physics is running here. So you can, those who are interested in the physics uh, and physics background, they can come and take our courses and join our batches for whatever they feel, uh, how, how, whatever you feel about it. So, uh, so now coming to our stat max. So let's, uh, let me introduce to you what basically the statistical mechanics is. Uh, without giving a, any, any definition to you, I just want to motivate myself to, to introduce to you the basically what the statistical mechanics is and what are the integral part of the statistical mechanics, right? So uh, first, uh, be even before I do that, I just mentioned to you that we are going to look to the statistical mechanics through, through the thermodynamics, right? So let me remind you the, what the thermodynamics is, right? Thermodynamics, you know that basically the dynamics associated with the your temperature changes and things like that, right? Uh, so temperature is a pretty much obvious quantity to you when you understand the thermodynamics, and uh, it is it is it is a very conventional and normal notion and easily understood by your and your senses. You can feel it, you can experience it. That's called your temperature, right? That's called your temperature. In the, in the mathematical physics classes, basically that's what uh, we have learned uh, that we have seen that how the basically the temperature gradient, something like this is associated with the flow of heat, like, right? So this is associated with the flow of heat, right? When there is a gradient in the temperature, you will see that the heat is going into the system. So, but now here, I just want to introduce to you the basically the non, uh, basically, the, let's say, I would say that there are various laws of thermodynamics that uh, reminds you how about the, uh, let's say, let me write down to you that the basically zeroth law. 
first law and second law. These are the few basic laws of thermodynamics that uh, you are aware of. I assume that you are aware because uh, if you want to know more about these things, you can go to our website, find out the thermal physics lecture, and you can, I mean, one of us have taught you already what are these first zero laws and first law. But I am just very much interested today to introduce to you basically the second law of thermodynamics and want to go from there, second law of thermodynamics. So what second law of thermodynamics is, that's the important question. And uh, what it leads us, uh, that's, that's the real of it, right? Because uh, uh, let, me, let me say to you, basically, this will give you the basic idea of entropy. You know that basically the you have heard of this term that entropy is a kind of energy, measure disorders in the system and on, so on and so forth. But what exactly this is, right? How it came into the picture and why you need a term, something called entropy to define anything, anything. You see, uh, even I would say the even the fundamentals of thermodynamics, let, let's say temperature is so fundamental that it's, it's embedded in the core of thermodynamics, right? But even you will see that the, it's, it's not as fundamental as entropy is, right? So that's the basic idea of, uh, of invoking the second law of thermodynamics and just looking the term, basically the term that's associated with entropy, right? So let me, let me just first write down to you a, pro, a setup. I just want to build up a set, setup here. Let's say this is my setup. And I just want to em emphasize this. I just want to look at the non-atomistic approach here. So second law. So what is the non-atomistic? I mean, consider matter as a continuum body and uh, you don't have to look at the electron, proton and the various the division of matter, let's say atom or molecules and that sort of aspect, right? It's a kind of continuum thing. So that's basically the non-atomistic theory of second law. So what I mean is con consider it a jar, something like this and fill this jar with some gas let's say up to this height and put a close at this end and put a weight over here. Once you do that, <clears throat> uh, let me again put a setup something like this, where you can now, you can, you can construct a similar setup, but now the point is that I just want to heat this bottom. I mean, I just want to connect it to a reservoir. Reservoir is a large, large source of, let's say, maybe, uh, maybe it captures the, your system, inside out and maintain the temperature, let's say 100 degrees Celsius. So you connect it uh, to a reservoir at 100 degrees Celsius and, and the setup is same, like you have a gas and the piston is somewhere kept over here. Now what you will see as soon as you connect it, there's a flow of heat light into the system because there's a temperature gradient and temperature gradient will announce to the flow of system. And that will result in lifting something like this. You will notice that now the, this weight is displaced, right? <clears throat> because the heat will do some sort of work and the uh, amount of displacing it to some higher extent, right? So you will see that the heat has flown into the system and there has been displacement of weight and the, and the kind of work has been done, right? So uh, there is a relation between heat flow and work done, right? There's a relation between heat flow and work done. So now the point is, let me remind you, basically there's a, there, there's a famous uh, engineer that's called Sadi Carnot, and it's a po popularly known as Carnot's engine. So the setup that I, I said before you basically can work as an engine, because the fact that if you remember, this is, let's say some temperature, let's say zero degrees Celsius, this gas is some temperature, zero degrees Celsius. And there's some weight that you kept over here. Now, you, when you raise the temperature, let's say hundred degrees Celsius, you will notice that this gas is, there's a heat flowing into the body. And because of that, there has been work done and the weight has been displaced, right? 
and now i again want to cool down this system and so that this system will back work as a back and forth kind of way the way engine has to work right now now considering all these uh, diagrams let's say 1 to 4 you will notice that the temperature has been increased and decreased and a whole cycle has been repeated right so that's basically the whole idea about the uh, Carnot engine right basically the engine who which operates basically between two temperature ranges let's say t1 and t2 one could be a higher other could be lower and so on and what what it does basically it does the energy is propelled into the system from a higher temperature let's say t equal to 100 degrees celsius work is done by lifting this piston you can see that basically the weight has been lifted and the, another amount of thermal energy is pumped out of the system when you connect it to the let's say on the reduce the temperature right that's basically a process that's we call the basically Carnot cycle or that's a pro, that's typically Carnot engine right uh, a Carnot cycle is different in some detail the most important difference is that all the processes are very gradual or let's say what we call quasi static quasi statics right that's very slow kind of process and uh, by, by the way, the idea of this was to set up like, the idea was to basically look at the efficiency of such sort of engine, right? How efficient those engines are, because that's what you are interested in, the efficiency of engines. And it was found that the limiting efficiency, let's say the textbook notation, that if this is my efficiency, it just, it just some function of, let's say, temperature, right? That's all it is. And the general expression, it turns out to be something like this. But let's not let's not delve into this because we are going to derive it in the later state. Uh, so, but what I mean is that it is some function of temperature. That's what it is. So the limiting efficiency is basically the function of temperature, not the substance we use. That's the real idea, right? And this work was published by Sadiq or not in 1824, and which which really laid the foundation for the second law of thermodynamics, right? And uh, and this is this is the the engine right because no engine has the efficiency which could be greater than the Carnot engine and we will see the many problems on a uh, lot of problems right on this because they are going to come in your exams and other aspects so by the way you should note it down that the limiting efficiency is basically the function of temperature that's all the idea is that's all right now let me look, look at the basically the few formulations number one the that's the kelvin's formulation of second law. So that's what we are looking into it. So in the Kelvin formulation, it was William Thompson, which is also known as Lord Kelvin. I mean, his era was something 20, 1824 to 1900. And he was also one of the founding father, father of the second law, one of the founding fathers, right? Uh, and who are the others? Let's say you will you will come to know who are the others. But in the, the called so-called non-atomistic theory, Kelvin is one of the founding father. Uh, other was of course R Rudolf Clausius, right? That you know that. So let uh, let me remind you what he his thoughts were, right? So so the, you know now the how the Carnot engine work and how its limiting efficiency depends upon the temperature in on which it work. So the Kelvin's uh, statement was that there could be no engine which when operating in cycles, the sole effect of which is pumping energy from one reservoir of heat and completely converting into work, right? So there could not be any such kind of efficient engine, right? Whose, whose only effect is to take the heat from a reserve, uh, let's say from a reservoir at higher temperature and completely convert into work. You So the idea is you can't take heat you can't take heat from a reservoir and completely convert into work, right? So that's the basic idea, right? You can't do that. So uh, does this contradict to the first law? No, no, I don't think so because uh, first law says about that conservation of energy. Uh, so 
but what it does the the idea of this law is basically it restrict the amount of work that you can get through a through a heat exchange right you can't simply take all heat from let's say reservoir and convert into the work because that's somehow forbidden right that's the statement so there there is a, a, another equally acceptable form, formalism and that's called basically uh, clausius clausius formalism formulation so in this formulation what happens basically so uh, so you will notice that these are all equivalent formulation and in this formulation the idea is that the, if you have a body let's say at higher temperature let's say t t2 100 degrees celsius and so and let's say this is at t1 let's say 0 degrees celsius so heat always from flow from a higher bo high body at a higher temperature to a body at a lower temperature right you spontaneously that's a natural process right that's a spontaneous process and you won't see the reversal of this until or otherwise some specified conditions are putting in uh, we put some sort of special conditions into the picture right so there are process which proceed simultaneously in one direction there is no reverse direction simultaneously i'm i'm uh, spontaneously that's the right word right so the spontaneous processes are this sort of process let's say flow of heat from a body at higher temperature to lower one or maybe you see the material let's say you uh, let's divide a material in two halves and put a gas in this and when you remove the partition you will notice that the the setup will be something like this but you can't see the reversal of this thing right that's a natural thing the natural thing is that the get, gas get mixed in the whole volume but when you when you have the gas in the entire body and you put a partition you won't notice a similar thing the way it was in the in the first half right so that the, so material flows from high to low concentration that's also a law right So now the idea is you you notice now there are a few things all process that at least two process that I mentioned right that uh, they proceeds in one direction right so the process is the processes that we mentions number one they have a pro property that they proceeds in one direction right and number two never proceeds never proceeds spontaneously in the reverse direction so these two features we can at least make it out and now the idea is uh, at that time it was not very clear that that all these processes are basically directed by a common law of nature so that's the point right what was the common law or is there any law or why this is happening that's the question right so uh, uh, to explain these sort of processes it uh, the concept of entropy was invoked that there that, that's where the entropy comes into the picture and uh, so the idea was at that time you uh, I, as i mentioned in the beginning that this is a non atomistic formulation right where basically the uh, entropy is just considered to be unidirectional and uh, it always increases in a spontaneous process for an isolated system right so the common law of nature was something like entropy which drives uh, system to uh, to to one direction and never proceed simultaneously in the opposite direction but uh, at that time the idea is also something like uh, it was a non atomistic formulation of of thermodynamics so it is not uh, as true as it should be uh, which will, we will see the more refined version of boltzmann especially his way of interpreting entropy and uh, but for the moment the entropy for these sort of systems uh, always increases in a spontaneous process for an isol isolated system, right? So let me write it down something like this, that entropy 
always increases in an isolated system for an spontaneous process. So for these sort of system, you will notice this behavior, right? So, but the point is, uh, there is an exception, there's a cases for which, I mean, very rare, but the entropy may also decrease, but you will see what sort of systems and how those sort of system can be formulated. But that's the that's discussion for uh, atomistic theory of entropy, which we take for the further classes. So I would say, I mean, we stop here today for the moment and in the next case, we will look entropy into more detail and then try to formulate uh, all other aspects through entropy. And then we are going to look into some problems which may be helpful for you. So thank you for today's class and we, we meet next time soon. Thank you.